we will now ask our presenter, Dr. Lee Jones from University of Georgia's Tifton campus to talk to us today about cow culling and heifer selection. So uh, my topic tonight is uh, selecting beef heifers as well as, as culling. So uh, I thought maybe the best thing to do would be to start off on the selecting beef replacements and, and then kind of work in chronological order, I guess, if you would. It's like two bookends, right? This is, we've got uh, good cattle going in on the front end and then uh, uh, other, other cattle going out uh, on, the, on the other end at, at the end of their, their lifespan in our herd. So uh, these are obviously topics that I enjoy a lot and uh, in, in talking about reproductive efficiency in, in cow-calf herds. So when we look at what are our goals for beef replacement heifers, and uh, that, that's pretty important to understand what our goals are because if we understand what our goals are, then we understand what kind of traits that we're selecting for. Ideally, we want her to calve by the time she's 24 months of age. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of research, the economics that's shown that cattle that calve early at 24 months of age and then continue calving every 12, every 12 months are going to be a lot more productive over the lifetime. Some farmers like to calve their heifers a little bit early. Uh, that gives them a little bit extra time to, to uh, be prepared to breed back that, that first time after they have a calf, when they breed back, they typically are a little bit uh, delayed in that breeding process. So sometimes they like to calve them a little bit early, like about 22, 23 months of age. And um, you don't want to you don't want them to calve much before that though, because um, there's a lot of development going on uh, um, at the, at that time. But or at least the first 21 days, you know, with the cow herd, that's when you want them to go ahead and calve. Ideally, we want them to calve unassisted. I'll talk a lot about that. Uh, we know that we know that calving ease is a function of good nutrition growth and then of course sire selection we have some great sire selection tools we would like for her to achieve 80 to 85 percent mature weight now we're going to talk about weights and ratios percentages but the fact is most farmers i'd say 95 percent of the farmers that i talk to don't have scales so we're kind of guessing weight and we're estimating so uh, when we do talk about some of these uh, guides as far as you know, weight and, and weight range for both uh, heifers to reach a breeding age as well as for heifers to reach, you know, a, a, the body weight they should reach at a two-year-old, then we're going to uh, be just really, these are strong suggestions because the research shows that when cattle hit these weights, they tend to be more fertile. Uh, and then the genomic tools. Uh, the genomic tools are still a work in progress, but the accuracy, the predictions, are, are getting better every day. As more da data is collected, as it's compared to phenotypic data, in other words, data that we can collect on the farm uh, every day, uh, that kind of data as it's compared, that is helping to refine the genomic tools that we're out, that we have out there. Um, so the data from crossbred cattle is getting more reliable. The data from purebred cattle where the genetics are known is, is certainly very accurate. On the dairy side, they've made, they're, they're way ahead of us on the beef side. And then the predictions are typically tend to be more accurate too, if the sire information is, is available. So when we look at heifers, uh, we really should consider selecting heifers from proven mothers. The apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. And, and these are gonna be cows that are proven on your farm. And, and that's really important because uh, a, a heifer that's doing great out in another state or in another geographical region or even another part of, of the state of Georgia may not perform exactly the same. And so it's important if we're going to keep heifers in our own herd, let's look at, at good cows and because good cows make good heifers. Uh, the body weight, that's important to understand the body weight because body weight is an important uh, function of when they reach puberty or sexual maturity and get ready to breed. Uh, we do want to be careful though, because if we only, if we only select the bigger, heavier, older heifers, then we might see some frame size 
uh, creep in our, in our herd. And we don't want cows that are too big for the environment. And, and it's important to, to find a good moderate frame cow that has, has, uh, is very efficient. So we definitely want to select out potential problems. These could be, uh, these could be young heifers, really light heifers, heifers that have a flighty temperament. The older I get, the less I, I, I it's, it's less fun, I guess, to have some animals that um, run away or bounce off the walls. Uh, then we may want to palpate and weigh and measure heifers early enough. So if, if I, about 12 months after weaning or around 12 months of age, if, if things, if my heifers don't look quite uh, fleshy enough or have rough hair coats or something, I may want to get them in and, and look at some management, weigh some heifers and see, get a get an estimate of some body weights and see if I'm really on track as far as developing heifers. Uh, our, our nutrition program on our heifers, really they need to approach about 60% mature weight. You're gonna see ranges anywhere from 55 to 65%. Uh, it's, it's, we don't get a lot of extra points for over conditioning heifers or over developing, it's just more expense. But if we underdevelop them, uh, then we're also not going to have the fertility that we're looking for. So we want to make sure that we're getting those heifers roughly 720 to 750 pounds. In, in my experience, that's where a lot of the Boss Taurus, Hereford, Angus, a lot of these English type breeds uh, are cycling. Now, if we've got a lot of Charlay, Simmental, uh, then we're going to need a little heavier weight, a little older. And if we've got some ear some Brangus, Brayford, or, or Brahmin influenced cattle, they're going to be a little older uh, before they reach sexual maturity so or puberty. So it's kind of important to understand some of the breed trends in, in, in your own herd. Uh, again, palpate to see if the heifers have reached puberty. This We can also identify pregnant heifers. I, I know that that doesn't always happen. Or sometimes people are like, well, how did that happen? Well, the bulls, the bulls will find cycling heifers quicker than you and I will. So sometimes the bull can get in there. Uh, Free Martins, uh, Nikki said that she had uh, a cow that had triplets. There's a good chance that the heifer, if one of those triplets is a bull, there's a good chance that heifer is infertile. And so she may be missing certain of her reproductive tract. And then that way, she's probably not going to be fertile. So we might be able to identify some problems. If you're doing estrus synchronization and artificial insemination on your heifers, you may want to go through this process at the time of put, using cedars um, or whatever your protocol is to try to select heifers. And we do this in the herd program, the heifer evaluation reproductive development program in our extension part. So it's a good time for vaccination program with a modified live. I know in some of our Zoom meetings, we've talked about a vaccination program but at least 60 days before breeding is a good time. Uh, and then the nutrition program also needs to make sure we include good new, uh, mineral program. Uh, that includes all of our macro and micro minerals. When do we need to do selection? Uh, really and truly, you're gonna start selecting shortly after they're born. You're gonna watch, look at the confirmation of a heifer, make sure that, that um, you know, she's structurally correct. And, uh, and look at her hoof, look at her, at her legs and make sure that, that that's the right confirmation. Uh, then, you know, you're going to watch her all the way through. Uh, weaning time is another good time to make the selection, just to really have a casual, uh, an overview of the heifers. Watch how they do. Uh, that's a really good time working with those heifers to evaluate disposition. And, and get rid of any heifers that maybe uh, doesn't calm down quickly or is a little bit flighty to handle. And so those, those are good times. And then again, about 12 months of age, that's another good time to make a kind of refine your selection. And we'll talk a little bit about some of our genomic tools that we have too. Pelvimetry, really, uh, we don't apply pelvimetry near like we used to. And that's basically just going in and measuring the birth canal. Uh, I think with our with our EPDs and our calving ease direct, our, our numbers as far as using easy calving sires, calving ease sires, we really don't need to apply pelvimetry, but it is a good tool in some cases to identify, you know, small heifers, extra small heifers. And then while we're looking at pelvimetry or measuring the, the birth canal, we can also palpate the reproductive tract. So there's some people that still use this 
as far as an overall accurate predictive tool, it's, it's not that great. Uh, it, it never really, as a technology, never turned out to deliver the, the hope that um, the early researchers had, had hoped that it would go to, and to predict the actual size that the cow could deliver without any assistance. Uh, so it never was quite that, that accurate, that specific. But using calving ease direct bulls and low birth weight bulls, that's probably the, mo the best choice as far as breeding heifers and having a, a, a heifers go ahead and calve without any assistance. Some of our genetic tools, uh, this down here on the right is Inherit, which is a Zoetis, and I'm certainly not, rec not recommending one company over the other, but Neogen uh, is another company that I'm familiar with, and then Zoetis Inherit. That's a, that's a company. And you can see some of these traits. Uh, that includes birth weight, weaning weights, yearling, and some docility, fertility scores. So these are very, very, um, like I said, the accuracy of some of these traits using some of our genomics tools are, are, are really improving over time. And it's even better is if, if you had, like if you bought a bull from a breeder and that bull's genomics profile is on record, then that's actually going to increase the uh, prediction uh, of some of these traits. So it's important to understand the, the value of keeping good records. And, and even though we're commercial herd, at least knowing some of the pedigree or some of the sire information. Um, genomic tools still don't replace really good management and phenotype selection, uh, even though you may have a, a a heifer that's got great genomic traits, if she doesn't have good confirmation, good feet, um, then that's going to be a problem and she's really not going to be able to stay in your herd. It can, real, it can help identify productive heifers and it may help identify problem heifers. And by that, I mean, if you look at some of the genomic predictions, some of them will rank these heifers in the top quartile and the bottom quartile. And, you know, I, I I talked to plenty of farmers over the years that after a cow reached about five or six years of age, he finally said, you know, she just never has really reached her potential. I wish that I had a test that, you know, as a heifer, be able to identify her. And so now we have some of those tests where we can actually pick out some of the bottom end heifers and maybe identify some of the, the higher quality heifers. And I know people that will do a genomics test on all of their potential replacements after they've done a phenotypic selection and then only keep the top half uh, according to what is uh, uh, gone through with genomics. They may breed everybody and they may go ahead and sell the other replacements, but they will keep the top half that, as far as genomic ranking. So we did a study a couple of years ago at the University of Georgia and we looked at some, some Brangus heifers and we did use the identity test and it ranked the heifers in quartiles and quarters, and it ranked these heifers in seven, 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 and six. And it was interesting when we uh, we did no estrus synchronization, no artificial insemination. They were just turned in with the bulls, and then I went in and preg checked with the ultrasound. And what we found was that the quartile one had the fewest they they got pregnant the quickest, and then the quartile two got pregnant next to the fastest, and then three. And I would have never, ever predicted this stepwise correlation between quartile one, two, and three. There was no way. And then when we looked at the gross income per heifer, because these calves uh, hit the ground and they calved earlier, they were a little bit heavier at weaning. We looked at the gross income per heifer at ranked quartile one, had the highest gross income, second, third, and then the quartile four group had the lowest income. And then we did the net. We did an economic modeling and we actually found that the quartile, uh, the bottom half of the heifers actually lost us money in their very first year, whereas the, the first and the second, the top half actually made, you can see the second half didn't make very much and that was more of a function of the age and weight of the calf than it was anything else. So unfortunately, this didn't pan out in year two for some management issues and some uh, some issues with the farm. They sold some of these heifers and we lost track, but the ones that we have, they actually ended up kind of evening out. So we didn't see the same uh, difference 
in in performance in in year two versus year three, but we lost our year year the second calf. Uh, but we also lost track of some heifers because of some some economic issues and and COVID and a few other things. Um, if we look at the effect of of when a heifer calves on her overall longevity, and as you understand beef cow economics, we know longevity is very very important, especially. You know, as, as we look at depreciation and, and, and having our expenses, because those, those heifers, our first expenses or our highest expenses are in the first two to three years of that cow's life. And then after that, she begins to maintain much easier. So it's a whole lot better if we can get that cow to stay in a herd for six, seven, even maybe eight years. So we want to make sure that we get longevity and some work done at you. Uh, United States Meat Animal Research Center in, in Nebraska showed that the, you know, when they calved had a lot to do with uh, their their overall longevity. And so heifers that calved in the first 21 days of their fir very first uh, calving season actually stayed in the herd uh, about a year and a half longer, whereas the heifers that calved in the last 21 days of a 60 three-day breeding season, uh, they actually exited the herd by the time they were five years old. So those animals hardly ever stayed around long enough to cover all of their development costs in their first three to four or five years of, of maintenance costs. Also, as far as lifetime productivity, as I mentioned, if a heifer calves at 24 months of age and then stays there over over her lifetime, she's going to produce more pounds of calf over her lifetime than, say, a heifer that, that calves 60 days later. And this, reach, these, this bar graph here shows that the heifers that calf early stay higher production all the way out through calf six. And about calf seven, they even out. So just a, an exercise that I tell farmers all the time, let's say we've got two amazing looking heifers and we might they might even be half sieves and uh heifer a she goes out there and she gets pregnant and then heifer b she kind of dilly dallies around him but she does finally get pregnant and she gets pregnant let's say two months later or let's just say 50 days later and and so they're good cattle they continue to have a calf every 12 months and so over 10 years and let's say they keep that difference over 10 years over that. That means that heifer A over those 10 years, 50 days every year, you know, there's 50 days more or 500 days more of calf growth. If a calf gains a pound and a half per day, that's 750 pounds more calf over her lifetime. Both heifers cost you the same to raise, cost you the same to maintain, but there's 750 pounds more calf. For a lot of people, that's a that's a calf and a half um, sold over those ten years. So just the effect of when that heifer calves first has a lot to do with their overall lifetime productivity. And this chart shows that. So uh, when we're looking at heifer selection, you know whatever tools that we have, whether they're phenotypic tools, that's just visual assessment and using. Things like, um, you know, some of our palpation scores with, with whether or not they've reached puberty or when they get pregnant or did they reach a certain target weight. You know, we want to make sure that we use those tools or we may use those in conjunction with some genomics tools. Uh, anyway, selecting the best heifers for longe longevity and productivity is essential. Uh, you know, if we're looking at inputs right now, one of the things that we, you know, we want to make sure that we're selecting good heifers because you know fertilizer costs a lot a lot of our inputs are a lot higher right now so we want to make sure that we keep heifers on the farm and we don't spend a lot of money on them just to have them leave at three years old or four years old will will they be able to achieve puberty and breed early you know will she need assistance at calving of course that's really determined by um by the, the sires we use. Another thing I failed to mention on selection is that a lot of times, especially for those of you who use an artificial insemination, I know some people are breeding their heifers with AI, 
you know, some of those, some of those daughters that were depending on the bulls. I know Nikki's been, Nikki spends a lot of time on selecting bulls for the Fort Valley herd and, and looking for sires that are going to produce good females. And so we can use some of those AI tools on some of those better heifers, those better cows, and use those sires on those cows to produce good females. And so that might be another way to select heifers much more intentionally than just by going out there and seeing what, what, what calf this year and who looks good, but I can do some genetic uh, selection ahead of time and select my bulls and use artificial insemination. But also that's very important on your sire selection. Are you picking a bull that's going to be used to produce good females? Or are you picking a bull that's just a terminal cross bull um, to go out there and produce heavy calves? Either way is appropriate and, and perfectly fine. You just kind of have to decide what your goals are. Does that heifer have the disposition or the temperament that I can tolerate or my facilities? Some people have facilities that really need some docility. Some people have some facilities that can handle a little hotter calf. Um, it just depends on the facilities and, and your handling skills. Genomic tools are helpful and they are useful and they're getting better. Uh, for $20, I might have, a, I might have a, a crystal ball into the future of that heifer. And so as we look at the predictions, we might be able to, for $20, we might be able to save ourselves some headache by eliminating some bottom end heifers, some heifers that may not have the fertility and the longevity. And then another thing to consider is that would I be economically, would I be better off to buy replacements than raise, than, than raise heifers myself? When you think about it, when you think about everything I've said, you know, we're going to have to commit some of our resources to developing heifers. And it may be more economically advantageous to work with a, a neighbor or someone else and just buy your heifers um, and then go straight terminal program or, or not uh, keep any heifers. Because, you know, when you keep that heifer that year, that cow's expenses are not covered by any sale of a calf. So you're automatically already, you know, you're seven to eight hundred dollars in the hole to start with. So it, you just have to look at the economics. Also, if any of you are an accountant, you know that, you know that the purchase cattle and depreciation is very, and, and the taxes are very different than they are for raised cattle. I know my accountant always asks me when I'm selling calves, if, are these calves out of a cow that you bought or are they out of a cow that you raised and they're taxed differently? So those are just some considerations about uh, looking at your own herd. So I'm going to move over into culling. Was there any questions uh, really quick about, about heifer selection? We didn't get into a lot on the artificial insemination and the breeding of heifers. That's probably another, another webinar. But um, are, were there any questions on heifer selection before I moved into cow culling? Uh, yes. Dr. Jones, um, this is Lamar Berry. I do have one question. Um, you mentioned um, in the um, vaccination on heifers 60 days before breeding. Uh, can you explain the 60 days in reference to uh, the difference with 60 days rather than 30 days? Yeah, thanks, Lamar. Good, good to talk to you. Um, yes, so there's some research that came out of South, South Dakota, Lamar. Now, the label on the bottle says 30 days before breeding, but on heifers, we want that second shot to be that 30 days. The first shot should be at least 60 days before breeding. Preferably, I'd like to see the first shot at weaning, right? Um, and, and then the second shot, maybe at 12 months of age or, or even the, you can give a shot before weaning. It really depends on your heifer development program and your, and your calf vaccination program. But that, that shot 30 days before, as if maybe things got away and you weren't able to get the cows, the heifers vaccinated correctly, we don't want to see them with their first shot, you know, more than or closer than 30 days. Ideally, we'd like to see that first shot well before 30 days before breeding and then the second shot um 30 days or even or even 60 days yet so the modified live vaccines and this this applies only to the modified live 
virus vaccines um, have the potential to have a short-term fertility, depressed fertility in those heifers. They come out of it, okay, a couple of cycles, and they're going to be fertile again. But um, I would I would certainly encourage folks to to get two, even I try to get three doses of the modified live in my heifers before breeding. And that means before they're 14 months of age. So I, I've already given one, they're still on their mother. I'm gonna give a second one at weaning and they'll get a third one before breeding. So, um, but that's a great question, Lamar. Appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you, sir. All right, so let's talk about culling cows. And I do really wanna emphasize, this is a serious opportunity to in, improve the condition of, of our herd. Um, so I just wanted to bring this up here. This is in Proverbs. And so know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. And so this is really important that we need to understand um, that they're a resource. And, and this is, you know, just, just paying attention and being good stewards, being good shepherds of our herd uh, is very important. Calling is a very important practice in, in maintaining a, a healthy, productive herd. So if we look at overall reproductive efficiency and, and for the cow-calf producer, reproductive efficiency is the single most important trait for, for profitability and productivity. Uh, reproduction is production. And so when we look at measuring production, we're going to look at weaning weights as well as weaning rates. That's how many of my cows actually weaned a calf. And then remember, we're going to think about in terms of pounds of beef produced per female bred. And then, you know, in other crops, we think about how many pounds or how many tons per acre. And it's pretty important that we might want to think about that in the terms of overall efficiency of our acreage production in, in beef cattle as well. So a well-managed herd is going to have more than 90% of the cows in that herd is going to produce a calf. And, a, a, and you know, a herd that's having struggles, uh, we're going to see probably three quarters or, or less are actually going to produce a calf every year. So, you know, if I own 40 cows and I'm only selling 30 calves every year, I might want to really look at those other 10 cows and think, okay, is there something wrong there? Do I need to seriously consider sending them down the road? Do I need to replace them or do I need to get down and only manage for 30 cows? It might be that 30 cows is the right stocking rate for my farm. A, a beef cow job description, get pregnant, have unassisted, deliver a healthy, vigorous calf, wean a healthy calf. I got 40 to 45 pounds per percent of body weight. Really and truly that ought to be up 50%. So I should change that. But nowadays that should be about 50% of her body weight at, at, at seven or eight months of, um, or eight, eight months of, of uh, age for that calf. They need to repeat it every year. Very little assistance from me. Um, and then they need to make sure that they do it economically and efficiently. Good records are absolutely essential. Um, and that includes production records, herd health records, and I want to make sure that I'm keeping a good inventory. Every animal needs to be identified. I need to have an inventory of my breeding herd. I've got 19 cows, uh, 19 uh, breeding cows, and I've already got a, sh a, a short list of cows that are leaving the farm by, at this coming fall when I wean. Um, I've already gone through there. Some of those are aged cows. Uh, some of them are cows that have lost a calf, or some of those cows have just been a pain in the backside uh, for me and I've just had enough and cull prices are really good are getting better and so hopefully in August if they're 90 cents uh, for coal cows and they're going to make the make the uh, the truck I need to make sure I've got an inventory if I've got breeding breeding bulls uh, have a, have an inventory there um, inventory of my market calves so the calves that I've already I've already identified some calves as replacements and they haven't even been weaned yet and I've identified some, some um, you know, calves that are going into my beef program. And then I want to make sure that I keep uh, herd additions updated in my records. So again, uh, some, just some generalized records. You don't have to have, you know, full pedigree or anything. 
thing, but it's really important to understand a production information on these cows. And that helps us make some good decisions because if a cow comes up open um, and, and, you know, like, like Nikki's cow that's got triplets, you know, it, it probably wouldn't be fair to her to call her this year. I mean, gee whiz, she's already produced enough in one year for three years. But, um, you know, that kind of information is important uh, to go ahead and keep that information and help that in, information to make an, or help influence my decisions. So know well the conditions of your pastures and the capacity. This is very important to understand the stocking rate of our pastures. And I, what I do is I see a lot of herds that feel like the more cows they have, the more beef that they're going to produce. But the problem is if I have too many cows, too few resources, then those cows cannot reach their product, productive potential. So I need to understand that overgrazing is going to reduce fertility. It's also going to reduce my, my weaning weights as well as my weaning rates. And so fewer animals can actually produce more offspring and pounds than too many undernourished animals. And so what I want to do is I just kind of use this as a visual. If I look at optimal stocking rate as a typical bell-shaped curve, in other words, I've got an increased return on my investment up to a point. And at that point, once I go past that, then I'm seeing a decrease on my, my productivity. So from this point here, we're going to see an increase in production and fertility until I hit that optimal stocking rate. Once I hit that optimal stocking rate, then we're going to see a, a decline in overall production and fertility. Not only that, we're going to, we, you know, if, if we maintain the optimal stocking rate, even if I have too few animals, we're going to see pretty much really good fertility and, and pretty good productivity for those animals. But once I begin to overstock, we're going to see a decline, not just in fertility, but also in herd health for a couple of reasons. One, those animals are not getting adequate nutrition. And, and two, we have some crowding issues. Increases parasite transmission, increase in in scours problems in my calves because we've got contaminated pastures where those calves are being born on. So we're going to see an, an increase in health problems if I'm overstocked. And this is cattle, sheep, goats, any type of, of animal that depends on grazing. If I'm overstocked, I'm going to see a decline in production. If I'm understocked, I can actually increase production by adding cows up to a point. At that point, then I'm going to actually decrease production. I may add 10 more cows, but I actually may reduce uh, production by as much as 12 to 15 cows worth of production losses. So it's very important to understand what this number really needs to be on your herd. If it's really good grass, we typically think about one cow per two acres. If I've got a lot of woods and a lot of trees in there, it may be one cow per two and a half to three acres but you just need to understand what the fertility of, of your pastures are and then, and then stock or even call back to that rate. So if I've, if I've got 40 cows and I've only got 30 calves, then I probably need to think about my optimal stocking rate, maybe 30 cows. And I just need to figure out which 10 cows need to be selected and, and leave the farm. So what are some causes of poor herd production? You know, when we see these things where we're having a higher number of open heifers, open cows, uh, we get an a, a extended calving season. And if I leave my bull out uh, and I'm getting cows that are actually calving five or six months later, then we know we've got a problem. And typically, oftentimes it's nutritionally related, but it could be disease related or even male infertility related. But uh, we need to make sure that if I've got a high number of, of open cows or late cabin cows, I need to figure out what reasons those are. Do I have old cows? Do I have young cows? Do I have uh, inadequate nutrition? I need to know what that is. So when I'm looking at culling, there's two categories of culling. One's involuntary. That's where the cows do the, cho the, do the picking. And one's voluntary. That's where I do the picking. So it's important to understand. So if I've got sick cows that are not going to get better with a shot or whatever, uh, that's an, that animal probably needs to leave the farm. 
that's an involuntary. That's something that I would rather that not happen that way. But the cow chose it. If she died, obviously that's involuntary. I didn't want that to happen, but um, cows do die. Or if they're open or didn't calve, that's another sign that maybe I'm, I've I possibly could be overstocked and I really need to look at culling. If this is an, an older cow uh, with bad teeth or something, and she needs to go down the road. If this is a younger cow, then I have a decision to make, and, and maybe I keep her and sell the older cow. Voluntary culling, and this, this would be ideal. And so the intent behind voluntary culling is to replace good cattle with better cattle. Over time, and this, 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 this takes time to develop a very good productive herd, over time, I'm going to get to the point that, oh, this is a good cow, but I've got a better heifer that I've bred and ate, you know, from a great sire, and then I'm in better genomics, and I'm actually going to replace this good cow with a better replacement. And, and these good cows still have a lot of market potential. So you might even be able to sell the pregnancies for, for more than what a cold cow would bring. So this, this herd's going to be more productive and certainly more efficient. And this is all by the owner's choosing and design. So when I'm looking at culling females, first and foremost, I'm going to look at getting rid of my no performing or my low performing females. These could be the ones that are open. Uh, the ones that calve lightweight calves, uh, you can see those, or maybe they're, they're, the calves aren't that good. Uh, milk production, heart, some people would have sheep, know what hard bag is. We actually can have low milk production in, in cows, and that can cause a lot of problems, and those calves are just not going to produce. Uh, confirmation issues, um, just looking at their overall structure. Sick, if they have sick calves, this could be an issue of colostrum quality. And I want to make sure that I'm just going to go ahead and identify those cows as calling disposition. Absolutely um, want to send them down the road as well. And then age. Um, cows do get older. Um, you know, I, cows, uh, e even though every year they get older, even though some farmers just they forget that. And, and I know I've known cows that were eight years old for four or five years in a row. And so it's important to understand that cows, cows do get old. Um, uh, other reasons, a bad bag, soundness issues, cows with bad hooves. You know, if cows have a bad, if they have a bad limp, uh, if they've stifled or something one day that they, they're going to lay down and they may not be able to get up. And so I want to make sure that I can sell those cows. This cow has a bad, has a, a bad, bad teeth. And so that cow is not going to be a very efficient grazer. Uh, Small specs, if, I, if I'm raising white-faced cattle, I definitely want to make sure that I'm looking at the eyes. And, and if an animal starting to develop cancer eye, then I get them out so that I can market them before that cancer eye becomes a problem and then I'm not able to sell her at all. Um, bad teeth and then, of course, bad attitude. So ideally, you know, so this is, this is something we call goat teats. In, in cows, uh, and you know, the first few years, it may not be a big, big deal, but over time, this teat right here is going to expand to the point that that calf's not going to be able to get his mouth around it and then get colostrum. So it's important to go ahead and look at these udders and, and make sure that in time we go ahead and put her on the short list to evaluate. At least if we don't call her, we evaluate her every year to see if maybe this is the year that she needs to leave the herd. So I put this selection together and you could probably make your own selection, but you know, if we looked at a progression of, of where we want to be, definitely the first couple of years, we want to get rid of these the ones that are sick or sickly, not thriving. Um, the poor doer and cows, you know, the cows just seem like they never can. Um, stay in good body condition, even though you've dewormed them, you've done this and you've done that. And so it might be a good idea to go ahead and, and send them down the road. Unproductive cows, these cows that are, have really high maintenance, but they're low fertility. Uh, this could be due to a past illness or some other unknown reason, whatever it is, we want to get those cows on that, on that, that uh, consideration list. 
And then physical defects, you can see this cow's got a ruptured prepubic tendon where she's got this large mass and that's actually, you know, like a hernia. So that cow definitely needs to make the list and, and go down the road. The thing is she may not produce much or, or may not bring much at the sale barn, but um, there's also a really good chance that if she were to try to lay down a calf, she couldn't and could even rupture this worse and we end up losing her completely. So it's important to go ahead and look at anything that might have some physical defects or some uh, injuries or something and make sure just um, either, either those animals need to be euthanized on the farm or they can go to the sale barn. Again, attitude always makes the list for me anymore. Uh, if she's hard to get caught, if she's hard, you know, we, we, I hear it all the time. Well, doc, she raises my best calf. I guarantee you, if I had a set of scales and we weighed her calf over everybody else's, that's probably not true. How, however, these cows do stay in the herd. I think just as a, you know, it's just something to talk about every year and to kind of keep life interesting, perhaps. Uh, lower producing cattle, anything that produces below average. You know, this is where we're starting to get into the real money making opportunities as far as we're going to start re replacing some of these below average producers with above average producers. And so um, ultimately, I think that we'd all love to be here where we've, we, we keep very few of these in our herd and that we've got a herd that's, you know, above average or at least more than 50 percent of those really top producing kind of cows. So those are that's why that's why I say culling is a great opportunity because it makes room for you know if I've got two cows and they're going to eat the same amount of grass I want a cow that's going to produce the best calf. So the benefits of the culling there's certainly more more resources for productive cows that's going to improve overall fertility it's going to have heavier weaning weights my calves are going to be healthier uh, I'm going to have fewer problems and that's really important especially as most of us on this list are probably part-time farmers and, and we've got a job somewhere else. Uh, and so we really need a resilient, trouble-free herd. And one of the best ways to do that is to have optimal stocking rates in our pastures. And so there's a lot less maintenance, a lot less inputs, less fertilizer this year. Um, fertilizer is hardly going to cover the, the cost of our calves. Uh, it's going to be improved profits from our cow herd. And it's going to lead to a lot healthier cows as well as calves. So with that, I think um, that's uh, what I have tonight. If I've got any, if we've got any questions. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a few things in the chat box. We have one question in the chat box. What else are the signs of a bad bag? Okay. Um, uh, so yeah. So one of the things. So one of the things I talked about was if we've got the teat ends that are really expanding, the other thing might be what we call a blind bag, blind, blind quarter. And that's where I might have a quarter that actually is not producing any milk at all. And it's going to be collapsed um, and very, very small or shrunk down. So you want to look at that. And, and if you, the other signs would just look at the calf behavior. I've actually picked out some calves sometimes that just seemed like they were never getting enough milk. They were always trying to nurse and they were going from quarter to quarter to quarter. Get that cow in and see sometimes cows can have something like hard bag uh, that we see and use. Cows can have something similar. You know, we don't think about it very often, but cows can develop mastitis. And if they do, that can cause uh, that bag to dry up. So, so really good question, but, um, what about yeah. poor ligament? Like their, their teats hang way down past their hocks. That can happen. And of course, if that happens, you know, what are we looking at? We're looking at the, the, um, the end of those teats can actually get in the mud. Uh, you know, especially when it's this hot, we've already got those, those Angus cows that are, that are hunting the mud puddle. Right. And so then those, the end of those teats get in the mud and the first thing that calf gets when he gets to try to go drink some milk is a mouthful of mud and, and that mud is actually other stuff too and so that doesn't do good for, for calf health but absolutely so if we look at overall confirmation of that udder and and um, the ligament structure if that's the case then that cow needs to be put on that 
that short list. And at the end of the year, when we wean, it's, um, you know, she just gets moved over. No, that was a very good presentation, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Dr. Noble. Did you mention what percent of the normal farmers you see have scales? How many actually weigh they can? What percent would you say? I, I, I said 5%, but that's a little, I mean, that there's a little bit of educated guess into that, Dr. Noble. Um, but I, I don't see a lot of scales on the farms. What about if you grouped them into good farm managers and poor farm managers? It would still be low like that? Uh, the better ones, they like to have scales because it helps them make some decisions. Plus, uh, there's a there's kind of a little bit of accountability there. And in other words, they they know which animals they're selling. And and um, it's just part of the de decision making process, because the more the more data you have, the better decisions you can make. And and that's that's part of that whole data collection. And if I can go through, you know, it's and it's really it becomes pretty important, especially as you know, the first levels of culling is kind of easy. And then as we begin to move up and we identify, you know, it's really easy to identify that that really poor doing calf versus a good doing calf. But as we begin to move our herd from the, up the levels, then we start selecting between, you know, it's just like um, that book, you know, from, from good to great. And so as we begin to move up, we're going to have to have those tools that help us refine our management. And a set of scales is one of those. And not only that, but it also helps us identify those cows. You know, if they're if they're only weaning at 40% of their body weight, then they're eating an awful lot of grass that they're not accounting for. And so those cows, if they're really heavy cows and they're producing lightweight calves, uh, we need to flip that ratio, right? We need to be that to, to a, a better ratio. So I've got 1,200 pound cows in my pasture that are weaning calves as big as my 1,400 pound cows. So, and she's eat, she's probably, I'm guessing she's, I mean, I'm not out there keep that kind of track, but, but I'm guessing that she's eating less grass than that 14, 1,500 pound cow. So, um, you know, and, and, and then that's, it's, it, you know, one of the, and this would be another webinar, we talk, start talking about stocking rate and overall beef production, but there's some, there's some cool studies that have shown that a little smaller kind of cow, you can actually stock more of them and produce more beef over, over a farm than, than a bunch of big cows. And so that's a, that's a, that's a cool, um, uh, that there's some cool studies that show that. And if you, as a veterinarian, if you had to look over and see when farmers are not doing well, what are the top three most common errors they're making with their farm, productivity-wise, profit-wise? Um, so some of the things I see, Dr. Noble, are, one, they're bulls. Are they keeping fertile bulls? And, and to me, that's, that's one of the biggest things I talk about is, is really putting pressure on their bulls, not just not just fertility, but also genetics. And sometimes we're looking for that cheapest, you know, cow freshener, just anything that can breed a cow. But I, I do, I do find bulls that especially during the summer, and we've already reached summer temperatures in, in here in late April, but um, I do find bulls that, that it hit a summer slump. And then uh, a Failure to keep records and identify cows. Uh, cows that don't have ear tags, I don't know if they're productive or not. I was at a farm not long ago, and the farmer didn't know exactly how many cows he had, but he told me about 30 to 35, and I looked out there, and I counted, 50, I counted 14 calves. And he didn't really, he had not been really thinking about the fact that you know, I really don't see the same number of calves as I do cows. It just was one of those things, you know, he was always feeding and he really wasn't keeping good records. And then I think um, not, not castrate the bull calves. You know, that's one of the things that's a really cheap way to get an extra 50 to 7,500 or $75 more per, per calf that I sell. 
you know, is, is castrating calves. So learning some good animal husbandry techniques and how to vaccinate, castrate, and then um, keeping good records and getting rid of those non-productive cows and then making sure my bulls are, fertile, are fertile. Those are probably three areas maybe, you know, off the right off the top of my head, Dr. Noble. Real good, thank you. All right, any other questions, comments, interests? All right, if not, thank you for coming.